All right, so a few weeks ago or a month or something ago, I teased that I do not think that Pyrrha needs to uh, needs the relics to be revived because I don't think that she needs to be revived at all. And I know, I know. The first two Ruby videos that I've done in 2020 are both about bringing back characters. Hold on. I never ever have stated that I think that it's good ideas to bring these characters back. I've only given my opinions on how they should be brought back if they were to be brought back because each of them kind of do have a bit of a spot in a story. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, the last video that I've done, the last review video that I've done, is about Roman and Adam, how they could be brought back, um, not together, but individually, and where they would fit in the story. If you're interested in that, uh, check the I card in the top, I don't know which corner, probably this corner, I think. Uh, check that out, it's a pretty good video. But today, we're talking about Pyrrha and how she can return in the show. And yes, I do believe, uh, what, by what I stated before, I do believe Pyrrha is alive. But now, let's just get into things and talk about where, where we left off with Pyrrha's character. When she got shot in the chest by Cinder with an arrow. And she poofed into dust by Cinder caressing her cheek. I don't think that Pyrrha's dead. She did not die there. I have believed ever since that episode aired that she's alive. That she was just transported. And th there's a reason for that. Basically, in that same scene, we see Cinder fire an arrow and Pyrrha throws her shield Captain America style, but the, the arrow unforms, turns into glowy dust, and then reforms uh, after, like, ahead of the shield and hits Pyrrha in the leg. I've always believed that that's what she did to Pyrrha. She just moved Pyrrha. She dusted her and reformed her somewhere else. But there's a couple of questions with that. One, why? Which I'll get into. But two, there's an issue with that. And that is Cinder's semblance. Uh, and we found out uh, recently, I think, that her semblance is called Scorching Caress. Basically, it allows her to superheat objects and manipulate their shape. Which, this is uh, where the theory gets a little shaky, but by logic, it still makes sense. Because a lot of what Cinder uses are glass arrows, the glass bows. She uses glass superheats them and reforms them. She's all, also manipulated sand, I believe. She manipulates things that can be heated and reconstructed. And by that, that kind of breaks the theory, which means that she can't do that to Pyrrha. Pyrrha would just burn. However, Cinder has also done the same thing to her clothing. She has manipulated her clothing, which, going by that logic, shouldn't they be burned? But instead, she's able to transform her clothing. She's able to manipulate things that can be burned, not smelted. And she's able to reconstruct them into other things. Could she just do that to a human? If she's able to do something as complex as a shirt, for instance, I'm sure that she can do a human as well. And there's also just the, the, the cherry on the cake or whatever, scorching caress, which is funny because, you know, she caressed Pyrrha's cheek before dusting her. Coincidence? I don't know. We'll leave that for you to decide. It's very interesting that her semblance is named after one of the most, like, big scenes in Ruby. The killing gesture. But let's just follow this logic and say that she can manipulate Pyrrha and transported her somewhere. The question is, where and why? Before, we had no idea. We couldn't really answer those questions. But now, I think they're pretty obvious. The where is Salem's territory, wherever that is, which in a video which I don't think will be up now, it's mentioned in the video where Salem lives and it's kind of been in our phase the entire time. iCard up there when the video's up, maybe? I don't know. So we have the where. It's sent to Salem. Salem exists now, so that's the answer. The why, though. And that's pretty straightforward. Cinder is just being cautious because she doesn't know if any maiden power is still trapped within Pyrrha. And I should mention before I go any further, we're gonna get a little headcanony, a little uh, fan fiction-y with this, just to bridge the gap between points. Trust me, we're going to go back to evidence, but Every now and then we're just gonna fill in the gap like this. But let's just say Cinder was just a little worried that Pyrrha still had some maiden power left in her. I feel like that Cinder being a logical woman, she wouldn't just kill Pyrrha and have that worry about the power going to somebody else. Because I feel like Cinder understands Pyrrha's capabilities. She's not just going to be thinking of Pyrrha, which will then transfer the power to Pyrrha. 
she's gonna be thinking about somebody else. That's just her worry. That explains why she didn't kill her, just so they know that they can extract the power later on. So basically what I'm saying is that Pyrrha has been taken, uh, she is now prisoner at Salem's base. And I doubt that because it's Pyrrha, she wouldn't comply with the villains immediately. She'd probably, you know, rebel a little bit. And so from there, they're either going to try and extract the power or train her. Or both. I mean, they, they can definitely do both. So why would they want to train her? Basically, it's just they know that Pyrrha, because of uh, Cinder Emerald and Mercury infiltrating Beacon, they know that Pyrrha is a top student there. I mean, even without that infiltration, they probably know that. Pyrrha seems to be a famous uh, huntress, or in the family of a famous huntress. What better plan for the villains to do than take the best student at Beacon, the best school, and turn them into a villain? That will give the villains a huge boost for status, mainly. And that shows how powerful they are. So now let's just say that they've been training Pyrrha. She's probably not 100% on their side. She never will. But after they've been training her, she's obviously not 100% along with the villains. She, she isn't obviously complying. She's training and getting stronger just because that helps her. But she's not buddy-buddy with anybody. And there's evidence to show that she actually, well, evidence to show. This is, this is the, the evidence where it's a little shaky. But basically there's some evidence there that shows that she actually slashed up Tyrion a bit and rebelled against him. So let's go all the way back to Tyrion's first introduction. So what's interesting in this battle is that Tyrion has taken quite the liking and or interest to Jon for some strange reason. So when, when everybody asks, who are you? Uh, this mysterious scorpion man, he, he replies, who I am does not interest you or you well, you do interest me, uh, to Jean. And that's kind of out of nowhere. Why, why would he do that? And even throughout their fight, you can see him look off to Jean a couple times and just, uh, he fights Ruby immediately trying to slash her up, but then when he goes to Jean, he just sits on his shield and stares at him. That's weird. Why is he taking a liking to Jean? What interests him about Jean? What's interesting about Jean? It's Jean. I'm not that I dislike Jean, but like, it's Jean. He's the most average basic person in the Ruby universe. But there is something that would definitely strike Tyrion as a little, hmm, that would strike him as a little interested. And that is Jean's equipment and battle stance that should be very similar, they should recognize, one, it's the, the equipment is very similar to Pyrrha's, and two, the battle stance, with them training Pyrrha in the background, he would be very familiar with that battle stance. And that's where the initial intrigue and interest comes from. Tyrion knows that Jean was close to Pyrrha if he adapted the same fighting stance. And I almost forgot, there is a bit of evidence, like I said, that Pyrrha slashed Tyrion up. And that's with these scars on his body. Obviously, at this point, a few years have passed. So this has been a few years of training. So I imagine near the beginning of their training, Pyrrha may have slashed up Tyrion a little bit. And as somebody pointed out, this is where I'm getting, I'm, if I remember to, a link in the description below, the video where I got this Tyrion info from. Uh, there's a video explaining that briefly. Uh, but they show exactly how Jean attacks, and I think it's like a right left and a right in certain positions and it matches up pretty well with Tyrion's scars and again Jean is training with Pyrrha's teachings so obviously she would attack very similarly so when she rebelled against Tyrion that's where the scars came from and it's been a few years since then most likely so the scars would have settled and I know a lot of that is very fan fiction-y but then there's that Tyrion point where he's interested in Jean for what reason the only logical conclusion is either he knows him, which Jean doesn't know Tyrion, so that doesn't make sense, or it's in the moment something interested him, and that had to have been the battle stance. There's nothing else about Jean that's appealing at all. But now, I hate to go back here, but we're going to dive into a little bit more fan fiction, but then we're going to be back with the strongest point I have, and I, I know it's... Just, but just bear with me, don't worry, it'll be quick. Let's say Cinder knew that Pyrrha wasn't really, she didn't have her heart in it, she's still rebelling a little bit, she, Cinder knows that she, Pyrrha is getting stronger, but her heart's not in it, so this is what she does. Salem takes uh, Pyrrha to the roof or a balcony or something and just 
stares off throughout the edge, and below them is a pit of grim goo. Remember the apes, they came out of the goo, and that's where they're standing above. So Salem grabs a hold of Pyrrha and is about to push her off. Then Pyrrha's like, wait, 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 please. Wait. Let me just say goodbye first. And Salem's like, you're not stupid enough to rebel me, and you're not strong enough to rebel me. Sure, I'll let you say goodbye to your friends one more time before you turn into a horrible monster and have to murder them. So as we kind of know a little bit, the villains have been keeping tabs on the heroes with Tyrion's first meeting, and then there was the whole, uh, I, what, what was it, Haven Academy? Everybody met up there at once, and then at, at Atlas, uh, Salem knew exactly where the heroes were. Clearly, she's one step ahead of them in that regard, which means that she probably knows where they are at almost all times. So basically what they did was they gave Pyrrha some glasses, cut her hair, and they made her look old, and said, hey, just say goodbye to your friends. And that is, if you couldn't tell, the red-haired woman. And this is where we get to more evidence and actual, like, you know, clues and good logic <clears throat> instead of fan fiction. So I believe that the red-haired woman is Pyrrha. It's not a ghost, it's not her mother or a relative, it is Pyrrha. How do I know this? Basically, it's been confirmed that it is not a ghost by, I believe, Casey Lee Williams. It's either Casey or Pyrrha's voice actress. One of the two. It has been confirmed it's not a ghost, it's not a spirit. It happened. It, that was a real woman. And they laughed at those theories because they were dumb. And so, but then they said, so regard, disregarding that theory, they said that the majority of people are wrong, but there are very few that are correct. And as far as I know, the majority of people believe that it is a relative, or uh, her mother, the sis a sister, or whatever. It is a relative of Pyrrha's. And that being the majority, that therefore means that they're wrong. And so the only other conclusion is that it is Pyrrha. Because as far as I know, there's not really any other theories out there. There's only those big three. She's a ghost, it's a relative, or it's Pyrrha. Not many people talk about the Pyrrha one, but... And by that logic, with the minority being correct, makes sense. So just by the power of deduction, I have concluded that it is probably Pyrrha, thanks to one of the voice actresses confirming it. So, so I just wanted to break down the scene itself, kind of just talk about each line. I know this is... A, we're talking about this a lot. This is honestly the main point of the video that I wanted to get to. So yes, of course, I put it at the end of the video. So let's get into this. It's really beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, why here? She trained here. Sanctum Academy. Everyone was crushed when she chose Beacon over Haven. I should mention, before we get too much into this, imagine, put yourself in the mindset that this is Pyrrha. Imagine this is Pyrrha saying this. So, she laughed and said that everybody had a bit, they, they were crushed that Pyrrha chose a different academy than the one that they wanted. No one wanted to see her go, but it was where she wanted to be. So right there, she said something very personal. It doesn't really make too much sense for somebody other than Pyrrha to say that. It was where she wanted to be. The only person who would know that more than anyone is Pyrrha. I'm just glad she was surrounded by such amazing people. I'm so glad that she was surrounded by such amazing people. Looks at Jean. I, of course, with this, either the mother could have known that Jean was a good friend, but Pyrrha would also know that as well, because obviously that was directed to Jean with the eye stare. And he even thinks something's up. And then this. She should be standing here. She should be standing here. She is. She is. I am like the only person on earth that thought that that was a weird line. She should be standing here. She is. I get it. They're talking about the statue. But 
If this is Pira, you know... She understood that she had a responsibility to try. I don't think she would regret her choice because a huntress would understand that there really wasn't a choice to make. And a huntress is what she always wanted to be. What's interesting is that her word choice and everything seems so, like, she seemed to choose each word specifically. She knew that she had a responsibility. She pauses every now and then throughout the sentence as if she's trying not to mess up and say that, oh, I knew I had a responsibility, right? It's just everything seems very as if she's trying to hide her identity, which is, that is where the theory used to break. Why, why is she hiding her identity? Well, if the villains are over her shoulder, watching her every move, making sure she doesn't reveal herself, that's a bit of a motivation to not reveal her identity. And then she says that uh, Pira just wanted to be a huntress, and then Jean says this. Pira never got the chance to graduate, but she was a huntress. Thank you. It, what's interesting is this woman's reaction. She cries. She tears up and says, thank you. Again, imagine that is Pira. Need I say more? But anyway, then the red-haired woman disappears and then what are probably dragged off by the villains. And honestly, that's the theory. It, just to break it down, Cinder transported Pira. Tyrion is evidence that she, she, she's she been kidnapped and rebelled against them because of the sword slashes, uh, the specific sword slashes. And then the red-haired woman, just a little bit of a breakdown of that scene. But I might as well just finish off my little fan fiction that I have going. Basically, what happens after this scene, uh, Salem once again pulls her up to the roof, pushes her in the vat of uh, pool of vat of goo and grim, turns her into a grim. I imagine her design would be white skin like Salem, black, red lines, whatever, wherever. Her hair, though, would grow back, but where it was cut would remain red, and the grew, the, the grown out part would be white. And uh, I think that'd look super cool. In a future video, I'll, I'll, I've theorized that in season nine, eight or nine, they go back to Vale. Uh, back at Beacon, and I feel like an interesting scene could happen there. With the characters going back to Vale, I feel like that that would be a good opportunity to have a return of Pyrrha, where she died and where she came back. Uh, two completely different situations, and it's just a very climactic battle between Pyrrha and Jean, probably. Or they could save her for a much later date, because uh, I. Uh, but I imagine when they fight her, they have to kill her. They're not going to let her go, or they're not going to revive her or anything. They're going to kill Pyrrha. Jean will kill Pyrrha. But that's basically the theory, and my little fan fiction. Uh, basically, it's... As, as I already did a little breakdown of the theory, I'm not going to do it again, but... I don't know, there's evidence there. Some weak points, some pretty strong points, the red-haired girl points, that that makes a lot of sense. There's no other person it could be. And I've kind of just filled in the gaps in between. Uh, but yeah, uh, do you believe that at all? I don't know. I, I feel like I'm the only person that's believed that Pyrrha is alive. And everybody laughs at me, but then soon I will have the laugh. Soon I will. Uh, I know, as I said, a bit of it is a little ridiculous, but that's just me filling in the blanks. We don't have anything to work with, so I'm doing that for you, I suppose. But the evidence that that is there makes sense, at least in my mind. But anyway... I hope you enjoyed. What are your thoughts on this? Do you have any other ideas? Do you think she's dead? Uh, what do you think, if she's alive, what do you think that she's been doing? Let me know down in the comments below, and let's get that discussion going. See ya!